I'm going to start off with the toughest one to Mary since Mary brought it up. She kind of whispered it in my ear. Um, I just have to hear some opinions on this about daraplatin. How can you take a drug that can reduce the activity of the enzyme, at least in the assays that were used in the studies that use the drug, that can reduce the activity of the enzyme by about 60 to 80 percent, do prospective randomized trials. Those randomized trials actually even showed, look like the drug changed plaque morphology by intravascular ultrasound and virtual histology, but yet when we get to hard outcomes in the clinical trials, it's completely flat. How can that be? Okay, well, in disclosure, I am a hematologist, not a cardiologist, so I'm not going to be I as think smart it's even as you about I think this. it's even better. But, you know, I think when you think about a drug to lower the risk, you know, our, our teaching is that if you have a biomarker of risk that you think is causal and you can alter the level of that biomarker, you should lower the risk. And so uh, I don't have an answer, obviously nobody does, but um, I think you have to think about who is the population under study? Um, is this something that should work as well in secondary prevention as it might in primary prevention, hasn't been tested in primary prevention? You know, by the time people have um, ACS, they have extensive atherosclerosis. It's been there for a long time, most of the time. Um, it looks like the lesions on that wonderful slide you had with the thick cap, the stable lesions. You know, is the drug getting in there and can alter, well, it may alter morphology of lesions. Is it altering um, the lesions that matter the most in, in causing problems? Um, you know, th th there's a changing face of what kinds of lesions cause cause coronary ischemia. So, you know, I think it's really complex. I don't have a good answer. Um, you know, some people might argue that the results mean that this biomarker is not causal. And, you know, that might be the case, you know, when you think about the measurement of the biomarker. You know, the other thing we're um, commonly taught as epidemiologists, that if a biomarker is causally related to risk, you should see a clear dose-response relationship of the risk with rising levels. We seem to see a a threshold effect, um, you, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the risk doesn't rise across the entire range of the distribution of the biomarker, so maybe the enzyme is not causal in the event. That doesn't mean it's not involved in atherogenesis, but maybe it's not really as involved in the event. Or, as or maybe if you're lowering it through already low levels that it doesn't matter. Yeah, we, right? we just so. don't really know, and, y y you know, you have to wonder, um, and I have no idea, um, you know, what the, the makers of that drug are going to be doing next, but you have to wonder whether there are other potential applications, and, and the thing I would think of is primary prevention. Right. You get at the people earlier. Of course, that's going to be not the kind of trial a company will do first, uh, because it's way more expensive and takes a lot longer to get the results, but, but that's kind of the way I think about it. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear what other people yeah, say. Yeah, I would love to hear some other, on this topic, if somebody else uh, has time, um, Actually, I think, Bill, you're in the back. You were first. Hi. Yes, I'm sure this is premature, but do you have any idea what the cost aspect is in a practical manner? And will insurance companies pay for this testing in a preventive way? Do you have any insight into that? I don't. Yes, I do. Oh, okay. um, the, um, the vendor supplying the materials is very competitive, and uh, it's going to be very affordable. And it'll be about what a person might tip their waiter uh, at the restaurant. And uh, so uh, it may be a little more than that, but not much, depending on how big a tipper you are, I suppose. <laughs> or where you eat. <laughs> and where you eat. At McDonald's, I suppose not. But, uh, but yeah, it's going to be very affordable. And we have a CPT4 code. And uh, I checked today, and the government's still reimbursing, I think, when you have a CPT4 code. And um, I really look for this test to be added to the lipid panel as well uh, down the road. I, I think that uh, the marker is probably that good. We need an inflammatory marker included, I think, in the typical lipid profile, which we haven't changed, by the way, in 30 years. And also, I, it's important to note that the LDL cholesterol on that panel is a calculated result in most cases and not a measured result. So I, I think probably uh, $30, to $30 may approach that in uh, typical laboratories. Now I know the ELISA method 
which is much more difficult to perform, requires a lot of batch testing and a micro titer plate system with wash steps and a dedicated technologist, that assay is very expensive. So the ELISA test is, is pretty expensive to perform in, in a laboratory setting like mine, uh, maybe not so much in a reference laboratory. But I think having this available on a totally automated line like I have at the University of Oklahoma, where uh, the uh, machines, actually the instruments, do the testing in an automated fashion, I think the cost is going to be very competitive. And that's an excellent question because we're always worrying about that. Compared to the C-reactive protein, do you consider this a superlative test? Yes, yes. I, uh, C-reactive protein uh, is very nonspecific, especially in the metabolic syndrome patients that very often bring with them inflammatory conditions from the adipose tissue. A lot of, a lot of those folks have joint problems because of their weight and extra girth. And so uh, uh, it's, it's a great test at ruling out. The CRP in, in our hands uh, is a better rule out marker than certainly rule in. And so uh, like a lot of tests, uh, you can get a lot of false positives and uh, so the specificity is not very good. I think what we're looking for is something that's um, more sensitive and specific, and I, I think this PLA2 test, uh, especially when looking at the upper quartile, uh, may fit the bill. You, you know, I'll Thank just you. give a different view on CRP just for a minute, because I do measure CRP in my patients, and um, my view on CRP is that I think it's pretty clear it's not pathogenic, it's not there at the scene of the crime like we show with LPPLA2. It doesn't participate in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, but CRP is a perfectly confounded blood test, meaning that all the, all the cardiovascular risk factors you're aware of actually are associated with elevated levels of CRP. And when those risk factors go away or improve, CRP comes down, um, uh, particularly obesity, elevations in LDL cholesterol, elevations in blood pressure, glycemic control, smoking, we can go on and on. So CRP is a great integrated barometer of cardiovascular risk or cardiovascular health. A and I think in general is really sufficiently different than LPFPLA2. And I've always been impressed by, I showed you the ERIC trial data about that independence of the two with respect to stroke pr uh, 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 prediction. So in my practice, you know, I do measure CRP and LPPLA2, uh, but for very, very different reasons. The FDA only has three approved uh, vascular inflammatory markers, and they're CRP, LPPLA2, and myeloproxidase, and the MPO is the one we don't measure. The other thing to follow up, Dr. McAuliffe, uh, the high-sensitivity CRP runs on our automated chemistry analyzer, which makes it readily available and again, I think that's the reason it's so commonly adopted because Dr. McAuliffe and others, uh, Dr. Cushman, for example, they can get those uh, assays quickly. They can get it out of the same sample that's already in the lab, perhaps getting other tests like lipid profiles and the like, and uh, very rapid. So, uh, and that makes, by, if we can automate it, we can have it cost effective. Okay, terrific. We had a couple of questions in the front, and you guys have been waiting for a long time. Go ahead. So, um, so I'm actually both Dr. Sperling and I had the same question about whether there's been there's there's any data with respect to either improvement in C statistic or net reclassification over and above um, you know like a standard lipid profile. Uh, that was um, the first question. Also, um, from what I recall, the Durablibib trial that um, there was a modest, I thought, 10% relative risk reduction that was statistically significant for the, actually, at least for the secondary endpoint. You know, actually, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I recall. I was on that ACC panel when that trial was um, released, I thought, last March, right, at ACC, mm -hmm. about a year and a half ago now. Um, so let, let me, uh, I didn't think it was completely negative. Right, right. let me ask, uh, answer your first question first, in that there have been reclassification studies 
um, uh, with or rec analyses that have looked at reclassification using the concentration assay. And it looks like it, it clearly reclassifies people um, kind of to the same extent that you would by moving 30 points on an LDL concentration value. And actually, I published that a few years ago with um, Peter Toth and others. So um, we think it does have the ability to reclassify individuals uh, based on risk. Um, that type of work has not yet been done with the activity essay, but the activity essay looks like it's, it's very unique and I think it's going to have to be done and it may not reclassify individuals at all through a range below 225. It looks like, looks like that risk pops up at that 225 uh, uh, level, so it's going to be quite interesting to look at reclassification there. I'm not so um, familiar with, um, you know, all the trials, stability, and all the other ones with, um, with uh, Adair Plata. My understanding is globally they were neutral, but if there were benefits in some of the subgroups, I know for sure that the intravascular ultrasound study was positive, meaning it, it clearly changed plaque morphology, and people were really scratching their heads why the binary events didn't, you know, the primary event wasn't positive. I don't know if anybody was on the trial here, anybody else has other insights, but it, it certainly was disappointing. We were about as close to what we thought was truly a pathogenic factor and a drug that influenced it. I know we've been down that road with uh, homocysteine, and we've been down it with several factors. You know, we're down that road with CRP. You know, there are two big kind of CRP lowering trials that are looking to influence outcomes. One is called the CERT trial, and it's using methotrexate, not in small doses. We're talking like 20 milligrams of methotrexate on uh, once a week. The other trial is using canamicumab, um, and it's called the CANTOS trial, and it's using the interleukin-1 beta uh, receptor uh, antagonist, which I think is a monoclonal antibody, I think, um, that uh, will, uh, has dramatic lowering in CRP, it lowers CRP by 80% or so. And so we will, in a sense, have this trial of CRP as a pathogenic factor. Um, I predict um, that those trials could be positive. I don't think they'll be positive because they lower CRP, but they may influence other things. But we are clearly in the era of inflammatory markers and cell signaling markers and enzymes being not only tools we can measure in the lab, but testable targets and trials. See, because I, I thought that the, you know, the actually meta-analysis data from LPPLA2 is Pretty good, as as good as like with C-reactive protein. So I'm just curious uh, if either you 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 or Mary might have an opinion as to why it it wasn't included as a risk marker in the ACC AHA guidelines, but was in the uh, I, I'm sorry in the 2013 it wasn't included, but it was included as you may recall, Mary, in the Phil Greenland. 2010 guidelines. Yeah, I wasn't involved in um, as an author in, in the ACC AHA guidelines, so I'm not really sure why it wasn't considered. Um, you know, perhaps because there wasn't as much information on the reclassification of risk. Of course, the problem when you think about the reclassification of risk is what are you comparing it against? So all the data on CRP, for example, and reclassification of risk was done sort of relative to the Framingham risk score. Well, now we have the pooled cohort, cohort risk equation, and the whole application of lipid-lowering therapy is different. You do reclassification of risk to try to decide if you're going to treat the patient differently, say, give them a statin versus not. And uh, there really hasn't been much out in terms of reclassification of risk on top of the pooled cohort risk equation. We're going to be pursuing some of those analyses uh, to try to get at that. Uh, you know, and I think some of those statistics, too, are a little bit overblown, perhaps. You know, the C index, the change in the C statistic, you know, even the best biomarker is only changing the C statistic by a couple percentage points. And, you know, it can be highly statistically significant, but what does it mean and how does a clinician interpret it? It's, it, it's really difficult. So um, we have a lot of nice statistics to try to get at whether something is clinical, clinically useful, but uh, really the bottom line of whether it's clinically useful relates to the fact that it predicts the risk and it can help a clinician and a patient decide what to do. You know, I'm a hematologist and I see a fair number of stroke patients in my practice. You know, young people with cryptogenic stroke mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. to try to figure out why they had the stroke. And I use uh, novel risk markers in that population because these patients want to understand why they got sick. You know, people who have minimal or no risk factors developing stroke or coronary disease. You know, I had a 31-year-old patient mm 
this week who had a STEMI mm. and then thrombosed his stent. Mm -hmm. And you know, why is that? And he wants to know why. Of course, unfortunately, in his case, he's still smoking, which was his only risk factor. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think that's you know, kind of an unmeasured benefit to some of this, um, at least in my practice, um, and I'm a, kind of a weird specialist, um, people want to understand why they got sick too. And so to some extent, um, this kind of lab workup can be helpful in that regard. Yeah, I'll give you my view on this, the whole C statistic or, or using models to try to anticipate uh, binary events. I had a, a chance to review a paper. I hope nobody's on the author group in this room recently, but it was looking at events that occurred over a 50 year period of time, 50, five, year, five, five zero. And the model was all predicated on um, baseline characteristics. And one of the criticisms of the paper is, listen, it's 50 years. People change over 50 years. Intercurrent therapies change. Our approach to treatments, patients could have had revascularization. Drugs Absolutely. can be on, drugs can be off. We're very limited in these studies that use baseline and then try to look over a long period of time. I think we're going to need to get to whole new methods that look at um, serial exposures uh, over time, concurrent exposures, on and off. And we need a whole new mathematics as it applies to biomarkers. And we better get going on it soon because we're going to have behind this, we're going to have genomics, the changes in gene expression over time, microRNAs. And um, I think in cardiovascular, I work a lot in nephrology and in diabetes. I think we're kind of stuck somehow in our thinking compared to the cancer doctors. I don't see the cancer doctors sweating this out. They are working in a, in a multivariate plane right now with their markers in, in cancer. And you know what? They go re-biopsy cancers. And we can do the same thing. We can test to take a sample of blood, check people at baseline, and we can kind of re-biopsy them later on with another sample of blood. And so I'm much more in favor of, of being open-minded to these tools, particularly ones now that are going to be low cost, very precise, very accurate, and available to us. Um, and I think we need to learn a lot more. What I've learned about the activity essay is that it's not this graded thing where you go every quantile and it goes up and up and up, but in fact, it kind of jumps up at the 80th percentile. That's very different than the concentration essay. And I, I think we have a lot more to learn, but it's a whole new exciting time, I think, for inflammatory markers. Other questions or comments? I know we've been at it for a while. Okay, terrific. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and close out the session. Thank you so much for attending. Enjoy uh, dinner and libations tonight, and we'll see everybody bright and early tomorrow. Good night. Bye.